Welcome to the New York Institute for the Humanities podcast. I'm Robert Boynton. William Finnegan has been a staff writer for The New Yorker magazine since 1987. He is the author of five books, among them Barbarian Days, his surfing memoir, which won the Pulitzer Prize in 2016. In this episode from The Institute's Vault, Finnegan speaks about his work in progress, Cold New World, Growing Up in a Harder Country, which was published in 1998. Well, Michael, Massing asked me to do this. We've been talking about the stuff I've been working on, and he suggested a title, Downward Mobility in America, which I thought sounded fine. But then a few days later, looking at it, I thought, no, that's not really it. And I called him up and asked him to add race in there somewhere, which he kindly did. And then a few days after that, I looked at it again, and it still wasn't right. And uh, I wanted to call Michael again and ask him to make it youth race and downward mobility. And maybe refine the American part as well, make it in four American communities or something like that. But I didn't want to wear out my welcome here before it even showed up. So I let it go. But I mentioned these second thoughts because I'm still a little concerned that some of you looking at this title may be expecting a preview of you know, new census figures or some other product of demographic and economic numbers crunching, something that's quite beyond my abilities. What I have been doing is trying to look closely for several years now at a variety of American communities that are, in their different ways, suffering decline or devastation. In each case, I've ended up focusing on an individual family, usually over several generations, with a particular emphasis on young people, that is, on teenagers or people in their early 20s. I'm especially interested in how people understand their own situations, insofar as I can draw that out. So my method has actually been, I suppose, in some ways, the opposite of the academic researchers, in that I've often gone out with a horribly vague idea of what I'm looking for and have tried to let the people I meet direct my research to a large degree, let them tell me what they think is happening, what they think is important, and define my story that way. Which isn't to say that I haven't brought my own biases, my own politics, to my reporting and to my analysis. I have, obviously. Or that I've chosen randomly which communities to spend my time in. On the contrary, hoping to get at some broad national patterns, I've been deliberately looking at different regions of the country, places widely separated from one another, and at families of different ethnicities, black, white, Latino. What these communities have in common is tough times, economic decline. Without taking up the issue now what the larger economy is doing, let me just adapt the metaphor used by Lester Thoreau in his new book, The Future of Capitalism, where he describes the global economy in terms of five tectonic plates, all in simultaneous motion, and say that I've been looking at American communities that are on the grinding edges of huge and quite vicious forces. These are communities where, to mix metaphors slightly, a lot of people feel like they're looking into the abyss. So what I'd like to do today is say a few things about each of the four places I've been studying and about some of the people I've come to know, and then try to draw out some more general themes. Beulah Morgan has been living in New Hallville, a working-class neighborhood of New Haven, since 1953. She moved there with her parents from Ansonia, a mill town a few miles west, because she says, quote, black people couldn't buy a house in a good neighborhood in Ansonia. By Beulah's parents' lights, New Hallville was a very good neighborhood. Its leafy streets and well-built three-family houses had been home to a stable population of factory workers and their families for more than a century. New Hall Street, where Beulah's parents bought their house, that ended at Olin Industries, an ammunition and brass factory that was the neighborhood's mainstay. In 1953, there was every reason to believe that Beulah's family's social and economic mobility would be upward in the American way. New Haven has actually had an African-American community since the 17th century. But until the Second World War, its members usually found themselves blocked from the better industrial jobs, compelled to accept instead lower wage employment as typically waiters or porters at Yale University. For many years, they were also blocked from living outside a ghetto near Yale known as Dixwell. Factory work went first to Irish immigrants, later to Germans and Eastern Europeans, then to Italians. But the era of immigration from Europe having ended, many of the jobs generated by the wartime industrial boom of the 1940s went to blacks. New Haven's black community grew from 5,000 in 1930 to 10,000 in 1950, 
to 23,000 in 1960. Most of the new arrivals were from the South, and in the 1950s and 1960s, many black families settled in Newhallville. The Olin plant was going strong. In 1953, it employed 6,500 people. All of the men in Beulah Morgan's family worked in factories at union jobs. Her second husband, Carl Morgan, whom she married in 1954, worked at Simpkins Industries. 45 years later, when I met the Morgans, he was still working there. Bueller herself had been working as a medical receptionist for more than 25 years. And yet New Haven, like every old industrial city in America, fell into a steep economic decline starting sometime in the late 1950s or early 1960s. Factories began to cut back and then to close. Unemployment spread. By 1981, when the Olin plant was broken up and sold, it employed barely a thousand people. The city's middle class, which had been trickling off to the suburbs since at least the First World War, started leaving in earnest. And while the overall population of the city shrank from 150,000 in 1960 to 127,000 in 1990, its black population continued to grow. By 1990, there were some 50,000 black people in New Haven. An influx of Latinos, mostly from Puerto Rico, and mostly like the growing population of blacks, unskilled and ill-educated, also began in the 1960s. Poverty came to engulf large parts of the city. The 1990 census found New Haven to be, I think it was the seventh poorest made in America. Real employment is estimated 30%. Among young people, it's 50%. Unsurprisingly, the arc of the city's decline has been paralleled by then Beulah Morgan's family. Beulah's parents sold their house on Newhall Street in 1975 and bought a comfortable house in Hamden, just outside New Haven, where they live today. Beulah and Carl, meanwhile, own a modest house in Newhallville. All five of Beulah's children, the youngest was born in 1961, still live in New Haven. Four of them are unemployed and cannot afford even to rent. Two live with Beulah, the other two have lived on and off with their parents since becoming adults, and each currently lives in an apartment paid for entirely by public assistance. Beulah's eight grandchildren have all lived with her at various times. She now has effective custody of two, and her mother has legal custody of three. <coughs> I offer all this family and communal background as a sort of introduction for Terry Jackson, Beulah's oldest grandchild, who's now 21. When Terry and I first met, he was 16, and already he had not had an easy life. His mother, Angelica, had been 16 herself when he was born. She went on to finish high school, but then got deep into drugs, freebasing cocaine, working for local dealers, and she's been in and out of rehab ever since. She's never married, though she now has two more sons. All three of her children have different fathers. Terry, for his part, has never had a close relationship with his own father, who now works as a school janitor. So he's basically raised by Beulah and Carl, though he was often moved around between relatives, including his paternal grandparents, and he was always the focus, I came to understand, of a great deal of tension over the monthly checks that Angelica received from the state to help raise him. Partly to escape that situation, Terry went to work very young, first selling newspapers on downtown street corners at the age of 11. By that time, he'd already fallen behind in school, largely I gathered because he needed glasses, which no one ever seemed to have it together to make sure he had. As a young child, Terry told me he had loved reading, but then it had started giving him headaches. He was clearly a bright kid and very industrious. He'd gotten his first real job at the age of 12 with a forged ID as a busboy in a restaurant and had been continually employed since, mostly in restaurants, usually working for minimum wage or less. Then when he was 15, a friend of a friend had offered him work that paid him $1,000 a week. And so Terry, like so many other young, poor, African-American males in this country, went into the illegal drug business, which was experiencing a great boom in New Haven in the late 1980s. Heroin, marijuana, and especially cocaine were selling like crazy, and the demand for labor was fierce. Of course, because of the huge risks involved, the <coughs> most desperate, those with the fewest other prospects, tended to go into street dealing. But the pay in the drug business was terrific. For those who work hard and were reasonably clever and lucky, who managed, that is, not to get shot or arrested. So Terry, at 15 and 16, was living large, as he would put it. He was also living largely unsupervised. His grandmother had kicked him out after he started dealing, but his mother and a series of girlfriends and the slightly higher echelon dealer he worked for each took him in at different times. Terry had few illusions about the drug trade or his own future in it. Although he was never shot in endless turf battles and other feuds between the local posses, many of his friends and associates were. And he had nothing but contempt for the addicts who were his customers. 
includes some of his relatives. But he obviously enjoyed his little run of teenage prosperity and backstreet prominence. As I say, this is around the time I met him. Eventually, inevitably, Terry got busted for dealing. And his life over the past few years has become a grim round of jails, low-wage jobs, failed runs at job corps programs and continuation schools, a baby daughter born out of wedlock, and ongoing strife within his increasingly immiserated family. He's surprisingly philosophical about most of his setbacks, at least with me, and even clear about the kind of economy he's still trying somehow to enter. He often talks about raising the funds to open a fish restaurant, saying things like, nowadays you've got to own your own. He fantasizes about going out to Hollywood and becoming an actor, or coming to New York to become a male model. A couple of weeks ago, he called and asked me for my agent's number to see if she could help him get into modeling. And whenever he hears that I've been off somewhere, like last fall, I told him I'd just been in England, he says, oh yeah, what's the economy like down there? His mother thinks he ought to go back down south, where they still have relatives. Angelica thinks the rural south is slower, safer, and generally saner than the urban north. But Terry isn't interested. To him, going down south is going backward. Like the undaunted American he is, he's intent on new horizons. Unfortunately, neither of us has any idea where those might actually lie for someone in his position. Also, I should add, Terry's worried that when his grandparents retire, they may not be able to keep up the payments on their house in Newhallville. So he's always brooding over schemes to raise the money to lift up the house, as he puts it, so that the bank can't take it away. For the second part of this project, I went down south have a look at some of the reality behind the pastoral fantasy one hears so much about in the inner cities of the North. I ended up spending the better part of six months in an area known as Deep East Texas on the Texas-Louisiana border. It's a poor, heavily wooded, quite beautiful region on the western end of the Great Southern Black Belt. That term refers to areas with populations at least 30% black. San Augustine County, the place where I stayed, can safely stand, I think, for the rural South that many black people left behind in the Great Migration north and west. Before the Civil War, it was slave work to cotton plantations. For a century afterward, it was mainly sharecropping. There were more people living in the county in the year 1900 than there are today. The cotton is now gone, and black family farming, which was still widespread only a generation ago, is essentially extinct too. The main local industries now are timber and chickens. Jobs are scarce and badly paid. Young people, especially young black people, continue to leave for the cities, Chicago, Los Angeles, Dallas, Houston. But what I found was that the traditional promise of the city, of new social and economic opportunity, had badly faded. In fact, in most people's minds, the city seemed to be associated primarily with drugs, violence, disease, and social breakdown. What was more, all these evils seemed to be streaming back to little St. Augustine, Crack cocaine was extremely popular and doing particularly heavy damage in the black community. AIDS, though it was rarely discussed, was already a local public health emergency. Some inner city afflictions were still unknown. The drug trade was not notably violent and there were no youth gangs, but a downward arc, much like the one I described in Beulah Morgan's family in New Haven, from a homeowning, steadily employed Second World War generation down through increasingly dispossessed, drug-troubled children and grandchildren, growing up without fathers, subsisting on public assistance, was clearly discernible among many families in St. Augustine as well. I spent the majority of my time there with an extended family called the Clarks in a tiny all-black village known as Kellyville. I won't try to describe the Clarks their lives in anything like the detail I've inflicted on you about Terry and his family in New Haven except to say that they are certainly suffering the knock-on effects of the deindustrialization that has so directly hammered their working class counterparts in the city. And that they too often take mental refuge in the kind of rural ideal that you hear older black people talk about in the North, even though they are, one might say, living in the midst of it. In Kellyville, in fact, it isn't only the older people who like to reminisce about the good old days. Lene Clark, who was 23 years old when we met, is one of the main people in my story about St. Augustine. She has a six-year-old son, works long shifts as what she calls a chicken plucker in a poultry processing plant owned by the Tyson Corporation. And she loved to regale with me with stories about what she calls her good old-fashioned country upbringing. The far better time that Lene remembers ended perhaps five years ago. Full of healthy homegrown food, home-churned butter, sweet well water, cows and mules, 
well-behaved children, a minimum of TV, and reliable men who married the girls they got pregnant. They had no junk food, and above all, no drugs and no AIDS. I should perhaps mention the obvious here that most of the older folks in desperate inner city neighborhoods who like to talk about and carry around with them a fond image of the rural place that they or their ancestors left behind also have competing memories, at least as vivid, of sharecropping, hunger, and the real world of Jim Crow. And from what I've seen of the rural South, the racial caste structure that keeps most black people on the bottom of the heap there is still, even after the Civil Rights Revolution, far more oppressive far less permeable than its urban counterparts north and south. For the third part of this thing, I went to the Yakima Valley in Washington State, which is a rich farming region and one of the many areas of this country that has recently received a big influx of Latino workers. The Yakima Valley has actually been starkly dependent on Mexican labor for more than 50 years, but it's only in the last 15 or 20 years that large numbers of Latinos have settled permanently there. So I wanted to look at how those people are doing and particularly at how their children, both Mexican-born and American-born, are doing. I'm actually not sure how much to say about what I found because a piece I wrote about, it just came out in The New Yorker a couple of weeks ago, and some of you I know have read that, and, and those already know much of what I have to say. So, very briefly, I focused there on a family from Zacatecas called the Guerreros. Rosa and Rafael, the parents, are farm workers and real old-fashioned UFW union militants. They have four children, two born here, two born in Mexico. And when I first met them a couple of years ago, their oldest son, Juan, was 18 and working in the fields with them. At that time, the struggle to organize the grape farm where the Guerrero's work was very intense and kind of hanging in the balance. But Juan, I discovered, had absolutely no interest in the union. I naturally wanted to know how that could be. So much of my reporting consisted of hanging out with Juan and his friends, trying to understand their lives and their thinking. What I found basically is that they're all so thoroughly Americanized that they often have shockingly little in common with their own parents. In Juan's case, he barely shares a language with Rosa and Rafael. They speak no English and his Spanish is terrible. This kind of rapid assimilation, this great disconnect, has many ramifications, of course, but it says nothing about which of the many layers of American life these kids will assimilate to. On the whole, in the Yakima Valley, I found a very disturbing pattern. That is, the children of recent immigrants, assuming they're under 13 or 14 when they arrive, and thus can still pick up English quickly, tend to do much better in school than immigrant children who have been in this country longer, who in turn do better than poor Latino children who were born here. Clearly, something about American life is not helping these kids to thrive. It's a little absurd to try to generalize about Latinos in the United States. There are too many different kinds of people from too many different homelands, not to mention the millions in the southwest U.S. who were there long before the Anglos arrived. But it's still worth noting that even with the millions of Latinos who have entered the American middle class since the Second World War, Latino school dropout rate, which is roughly 50 percent, is higher than that of any other ethnic group that the census measures huge number of Latino kids are apparently simply failing to bond with this country's school system. Certainly that's true in the Yakima Valley. Very few of Juan's peers are managing to finish high school. He was expelled for fighting, though the same school administrators who expelled him told me they thought he was quite intelligent. And virtually nobody Juan knows is going on to college. Of course, kids who don't make it in school these days, particularly poor kids, very often get into gangs. And the youth gang scene in the Yakima Valley is quite out of control, generating a constant stream of drive-by shootings and other violent crimes. Many immigrant parents talk about taking their kids back to Mexico just to keep them safe, and some of them actually do it. Juan himself scorns gangs. He thinks they're lame and kitschy, which is what he thinks of most everything Latino. His favorite bands are Nirvana and Smashing Pumpkins. But uh, this preference for Anglo culture hasn't helped him avoid trouble with the law or helped him avoid being labeled a gang member by the local authorities. His father, Rafael, described Juan's dilemma perfectly, I thought, when he told me, quote, I was just like Juan when I was his age. My friends and I got in a lot of fights. The difference was that the police didn't watch us so closely. They weren't afraid of us. And they didn't arrest us for every little thing. There was a lot of discrimination here. Even in Mexico, where the rich hate the poor, we didn't have discrimination like this. Today, Juan is sitting in jail in Yakima, serving a one-year sentence for misdemeanor marijuana possession, 
maximum sentence allowed by law. Found a joint in the ashtray of a car he was in. His parents, needless to say, are quite miserable. This is a long, long way from what they hope to find for their children in El Norte. So I'm still in the midst of reporting the last installment in this series. It's about white kids in an outer suburb of Los Angeles called the Antelope Valley. I must say, I find the Antelope Valley a very strange place. It was lightly populated until the 1980s, less than 100,000 people living there, most of them working in local aerospace and defense plants. Although it's in Los Angeles County, it was considered too far out for people who work in the city to live there. But that changed in the 1980s with the construction of a new freeway and with a sharp rise in LA housing costs, which led to a tremendous building boom all over Southern California. By the early 1990s, there were suddenly 400,000 people living in the Antelope Valley, most of them in vast new housing tracts, with a high percentage of these new residents making a long, hard commute, something like two hours each way into the city. Now, as you probably know, most of Southern California fell into a severe recession five or six years ago. Cutbacks in the aerospace industry and in federal defense contracts have really rocked the economy there. The collapse of land and housing values has been especially dramatic. In the Antelope Valley, according to some economists, land prices have fallen by 90% since 1991. House prices have fallen by as much as 50%. In combination with all the job losses from post-Cold War downsizing, what this means, and the Antelope Valley is not the only California community in such straits, is a kind of ongoing economic implosion. So many families have had to declare bankruptcy and walk away from their mortgages that USA Today recently called the Antelope Valley the foreclosure capital of the country. You see whole brand new neighborhoods, all these big four or five bedroom Spanish style tile roofed houses boarded up or abandoned unfinished. Now white people, Anglos, are a minority, an ever shrinking minority in Los Angeles County. But in the Antelope Valley, as in most of the city's outer suburbs, which have been the recipients of a great deal of white flight, whites are still a solid majority, 70-75%. So most of the people suddenly going on public assistance there, moving into housing that's been taken over by HUD, and generally falling into what's left of the social safety net, are white, many of them downwardly mobile from the managerial middle class. But what's most striking at first glance about this kind of suburban social crisis and deepening poverty is all the ways it resembles what we normally think of as the post-60s, post-industrial, black and Latino inner city. Drug abuse and illegal drug trade are major problems, major <coughs> destroyers of families. The drug of choice in the Antelope Valley is a potent, highly addictive form of speed, crystal methamphetamine, and it's currently cutting a swath through the place very much like the path of destruction left by crack cocaine in lower class black and Latino communities over the past 10 years. Thus, for instance, a startling number of white kids in the Antelope Valley are being raised by their grandparents. And when I ask people why, the answer is almost always the same. Mom is strung out on speed. The more common term is actually tweaked out. Or she's in jail on drug-related charges or dead from an OD. Youth gangs, some of them imported from central LA, some of them not, are thriving in the Antelope Valley, terrorizing school kids and the community in general. Teen pregnancy rates have soared in the last few years, as have school dropout rates, violent crime, and other indicators of decline. And the rise in juvenile delinquency, I should perhaps mention, is often linked by social workers, juvenile probation officers, and others familiar with the problem, not just to family breakdown and poverty, but also to the situations of families that are managing to keep it together, in the sense that both parents are still employed, but where parents have to commute such long distances that they're gone 15 or 16 hours a day so that children are left unsupervised for long periods and thus get into trouble. Now, among the youth gangs in the Antelope Valley, the police estimate that there are at least 200 active gangs. The most noteworthy to my eye are a loose network of white supremacist skinheads, many of them in the methamphetamine trade. These skinhead gangs have been responsible for a great deal of violence, including a number of federally prosecuted hate crimes against black and Latino residents and they generally seem to loom large in the minds of everyone in the area, including other white kids. In fact, their bitterest enemies in the local gang world are a group, also largely white, of anti-racist skinheads. So I've ended up, ended up concentrating my reporting on them, focusing particularly on a girl named Mindy Turner, who is 17 and just recently left a white power gang that calls itself the Nazi Lowriders. Mindy's family is properly horrified that she ever got involved with such a group. Her mother, who is single, steadily employed, and a political liberal, 
and her grandmother, who is the matriarch of a large lower middle class clan, both blame it on her methamphetamine addiction, which began when she was about 14. But there's much more to it than that, I think. And even though Mindy is a smart, likable kid, I think there's a fairly good chance that she may yet be drawn back into this racist scene. Her personal cultural icons are a baffling mix. Her two big heroes are John Lennon and Charles Manson. For someone her age, she's been through a startling number of phases. Uh, before she was a neo-Nazi, she was a Hesher, a heavy metal fan into pot. Then for a little while, she was a hippie into reggae. Then she wanted to be a Jew, but that turned out to take too long. So she became a Mormon instead. Um, yeah. And when she describes for me these various scenes from her adolescence, it's clear that her time with the skinheads had a special intensity and warmth that she truly misses. Also, she still goes out with a guy. In fact, she's now pregnant by this guy who's down with the Nazi lowriders. As I say, I'm still in the midst of reporting the story, so I'll just say a couple more things about it. One being the obvious, that these white power gang kids actually express a much broader community anxiety about white downward mobility in general, particularly where it intersects with black and Latino upward mobility, which it does in the Antelope Valley, because many of the black and Latino newcomers are middle class families buying their first homes in the suburbs. And that intersection is, of course, a pretty explosive point for whites with their historically ingrained expectations of color caste privilege. And one of the reasons I find the Antelope Valley such a strange place, incidentally, is that having grown so fast, it effectively has no history. It's this instant city, just, you know, add shopping malls and water. And the kids growing up there feel that, of course. And perhaps for that reason, they seem far more obsessed with identity questions than kids I've interviewed elsewhere. Far more desperate to figure out who they are, to define themselves in all sorts of fierce and careful ways. And what's most striking about the terms they come up with is how much they have to do with race or with various received American ideas about race. It's as if all the toxins of this country's long, terrible history of racial fear, hatred, and oppression were now settling in among these lost suburban kids, producing bizarre new forms of ancient illnesses. At least I've had some of the weirdest conversations of my life there. And not just with young white supremacist skinheads who break off to Sieg Heil every other passing car. The anti-racist skinheads, for all their multicultural idealism, are just as ferocious and in their own way just as nuts. A last point about this California story. Even more than other states, I think, the jails in California, the state prison system and its vast youth component, the county camps and lockups, play a crucial role in the incubation of hardcore criminal racism. Kids go in petty thieves and come out violent white supremacists. And the pervasiveness of the penal system there is quite staggering. Mindy and her friends, including middle-class girls without the slightest involvement in gangs, all know people in jail. Something like one in five workers in the state is now employed somewhere in criminal justice. Fifteen years ago, the prison budget was one-sixth the higher education budget Today, it is the larger of the two, and it is growing astronomically. Fifteen more prisons are scheduled to be built by the year 2000, and projected spending on prisons for the year 2002 is 18 times projected spending on the state's university system. So those are the four places I've been looking at. I fear it's too many to hit you with all at once, but some of the stories I've been working on. I think there is a lot of questions, and I'll just make a couple of general observations before opening this up and seeing what would interest you. One is the sheer brutality, as I see it, of growing up in this country today, especially growing up poor. It's a cold, cold culture out there. And I see kids turning every which way for some kind of warmth and on the whole finding very little. There are plenty of fundamentalisms around, race nationalisms and other backward looking simple answers. And each of the young people I've been writing about confronts some version of them. Terry in New Haven worked for a while for the Nation of Islam and has an uncle who's a Christian fundamentalist. And he has spent a lot of time thinking about and so far rejecting the conversion efforts of both faiths. Lene in East Texas often wishes aloud that she had her mother's and her grandmother's passionate faith in a Southern Baptist God, anything to deliver her from what she regards as a fallen modern world. Juan in the Yakima Valley, it's far too much the MTV ironist for the 
folk romanticism of Latino gang life, except, he says, when he's in jail, when it's suddenly important to be Mexican so that somebody has your back. And then, of course, there's Mindy searching frantically for some sort of sustaining circle in the spiritual vacuum of a bedroom community in economic freefall. I think that most American kids getting ready to enter this economy grasp the basics, whether or not they ever tune into the actual economic debates. That the middle class is shrinking, that manufacturing jobs are steadily disappearing, that economic inequality is growing. And whether the white majority chooses to recognize it or not, I think it's clear that African Americans and Latinos are being hurt disproportionately by the economic contractions that are reducing employment security throughout the country. I thought this recent series in the Times on corporate downsizing, prompted largely, I'm afraid, by the increasingly visible plight of downsized executives, had one great line in it where an older black man saying something about how black suffering during the Great Depression might not have seemed as dramatic as all those white men jumping from Wall Street skyscrapers pointed out that that was only because you couldn't really kill yourself jumping out of a basement. The struggle for some sort of racial justice has obviously become more complicated since the end of the civil rights period. We're obviously living through a time of post-reform backlash of general disillusionment and discouragement. 20 years ago, who would have dreamed that we would now be seeing a resurgence of 19th century style race science with bestsellers like The Bell Curve? Sometimes it seems as if the right will grasp at anything to explain why African Americans continue to suffer poverty and deprivation in a socioeconomic caste system that is in crucial ways simply not changed. More immediately, look at the Fifth Circuit Court's decision last week outlawing affirmative action and admissions to the University of Texas Law School, or the Clinton administration's recent decision to suspend minority set-asides for federal government contracts. This is backlash writ large. Something fundamental has changed, however, with the end of the industrial era. I thought New Haven might be an interesting place to look at, partly because it was a subject of Robert Dahl's classic work of political science, Who Governs, in which he describes the shifting of municipal power through a long succession of groups, from the founding Puritan elites to a century or so of entrepreneurs, and then on to a series of ethnic immigrant groups, each rising from poverty, partly on the strength of political patronage in the case of the immigrant groups. Around the time I started working in New Haven, the city had just elected its first African-American mayor. But as symbolically meaningful as that was, it was soon obvious that it would make little difference to the city's poor black masses. As in other cities around the country, African-Americans were taking over municipal governments at a time when there was essentially no wealth left to redistribute. But it isn't as if there is more poverty now than there ever was before. On the contrary, and until this century, after all, poverty was general. It was a condition of the great majority of people. With the advent of modern democracy, that fact had political consequences. The labor movement rose when the majority of Americans was still poor. Not coincidentally, that is no longer the case. Today, the poor are a minority. But poverty in the United States is not, of course, a matter of scarcity. This is a rich country. There's more than enough to go around. Poverty here is a matter of political economy and politically the poor are all but powerless. The post-industrial economy has a limited demand for unskilled labor, certainly for unskilled labor that will pay a living wage. And I think the decline of public education, especially in poor and working class neighborhoods, is probably the starkest illustration one could ask for <coughs> on how the ladder of upward mobility has lately been simply yanked out of the reach of millions of young people. So what do young people themselves make of this darkening scene? Well, they make an awesome amount of culture, for one thing. Between music and gangs, and clothes and slang, and endlessly mutating tribes and cults and zines. And I often might find myself wondering whether it's all culture that's converging through TV and other mass media into one great consumerist, uncritical, apolitical lump, or whether it's culture that's terminally fragmenting into ever more narcissistic small differences between skaters and taggers and cholos and gangsters and skinheads and punks and heshers and goths and on and on. I also wonder what's happening to the more traditional pockets of cultural resistance, like the core black culture, quote unquote, that the anthropologist John Langston Gwaltney just celebrates in his book Dry Long So, the solid, unconquered core with its classical skepticism and wry pessimism about white-dominated America. Can it survive the postmodern onslaught of endlessly sold liberal consumerism 
the ideological message pumped into black communities, into all communities, 24 hours a day, primarily through TV. And what about the left? What's left of it? Can it stop fragmenting and perhaps start to engage the energy of all these understandably disaffected, cynical kids? I'm not optimistic about any of this, I should say, but I may be just too immersed in the day-to-day -day struggles of the people I'm writing about to have much perspective. So I would love to know what you think or what, if anything, interests you or irritates you about what I've said. This podcast was brought to you by the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU and the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. You can find us on Stitcher, iTunes, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. For more information, visit us at nyihumanities.org.